Well, welcome everybody. I'm Rob Nickerson. I'm a member of the uh, steering committee of the Northern California chapter of American Pilgrims on the Camino. Uh, and we as a chapter are presenting uh, a uh, packing presentation, what to take, where to get it, and how to carry it. And we're looking forward to uh, uh, having uh, your questions later on. Please, if you have questions, put them in the chat. We'll get to them at the very, the very end. A little bit about me before we get going here. I have been to Spain, uh, I don't know, eight or nine times. I'm not, I'm not quite sure how many. I've, I've walked uh, uh, different segments of the different Caminos uh, at least eight times uh, and over a thousand kilometers. And every time I walk, I've carried my backpack. And every time I've carried my backpack, I've wished I'd had less in it. Um, but that's uh, uh, what the nature of, uh, of the Camino is. Um, so this is going to be a presentation where we uh, take the experience, my experience, and also the experience of some other really veteran um, uh, pilgrims, uh, and let, let you know what uh, what we think that you should be should be carrying with you. It doesn't want to go. Hang on. There we go. So this presentation is part of what we call the Camino 101 series um, that has five parts to it. Camino basics, which you need to know to get started. Packing, that's this presentation. Uh, the Camino routes, where we uh, explain different routes. Uh, technology on the Camino, where we tell you all about smartphones and things like that. And then uh, returning home, which we haven't had for a while because, because people haven't been going. But we're hoping next fall that uh, when we have a whole bunch of pilgrims coming back, that we'll be able to have a really good presentation on challenges and moving forward. Now, what's the problem here? Uh, well, the problem is you walk day after day after day, et cetera. You know this, you know the feeling. If, if you've been there, well, if you haven't been there, those, those two thirds of you who say that you haven't walked yet, you don't know it. You're just gonna have to believe us when we, when we tell you this is how it is. Uh, you carry everything in your backpack. Um, and it's heavy. Um, and at some point you say, gosh, I wish I hadn't taken that much stuff. And uh, this is, everybody goes through this. Everybody who's walked has gone through this before. So what's our, what's the solution to this? Well, the solution is careful planning of what you take before you go. Um, you, if you think about it and you, you plan what you're going to take, um, the problem, the problem may still be there, but it won't be as severe. And the objective of this presentation is to help you with that planning. So hopefully by the time you finish this, you'll know what not to take on your, on your next Camino. Now in this talk, um, first I'm gonna give you what I call maxims about Camino packing, truths about Camino packing. Uh, then we're gonna have a panel discussion by Camino veterans of what they take. And this is not gonna be just about what I take, it's gonna be what, we, uh, what some of our really experienced um, uh, veterans, uh, pilgrims have taken. And then finally, we'll do Q&A. So put your questions in the chat window, and we'll come back to them later on. We, we just can't do it during the middle of the presentation. So packing maxims, what do I mean by that? These are uh, uh, Camino packing, quote, truths. I have to put truths in, in quotes here. Uh, and the list that you're going to see right now is a totally biased list. It's my, it's my list of, of, of packing maxims. Uh, it's nobody else's, uh, and um, uh, and so you'll just have to uh, you'll just have to accept it as as a bias list. Uh, the first thing is less is more. The less you take, the more happy you will be. I guarantee you this. Uh, it, it, leave it home. Don't take it. You don't need it. Uh, and and take less on your on your Camino. It's not a fashion show. No one will care what you look like, what you wear. No one will, no one will care about this. I remember I was at uh, an albergue. I forgot where it was uh, uh, in, in Spain. And we were in the dining room having, having supper. And there was a group of pilgrims that were biking the Camino. And they were on their biker shorts and their biker outfits and all that type of stuff. And um, in walks one member of their group, all dressed up in white pants, white top, I think she might have had white heels on. I'm not, not quite sure. She looked fabulous. I mean, she looked great. Um, 
uh, very stylish and everything, but she just did not fit in with everybody else. Nobody cares what you look like. It's not a fashion show. Don't worry about it. If you aren't going to use it more than once, don't take it. Uh, you don't need it. You, you, you only take things if you, if you really are going to need them and use them. Uh, leave it behind. You don't, you don't need whatever that thing is that you're thinking about taking. If you just think you will need it, you won't, uh, with the emphasis on the word think there. Uh, you know, don't, don't, you don't need it, believe me. If it only weighs, and put in anything you want for the weight there, don't take it. I was at a um, presentation about technology, and this one woman in the back of the room raised her hand and said, well, well, my, um, uh, my iPad mini uh, only weighs one pound. I'm going to take it. Uh, there was a collective groan from the audience when, when she said that. One pound is a lot of weight, uh, believe me. Uh, and you, you'd say, well, one ounce isn't much. It isn't, except when you have 16 of them, and then you have a pound. So uh, leave it behind if, if your reason for taking it is it only weighs a certain amount. Kiss. I don't know whether you know what this means, um, uh, but I'll, I'll tell you. It means keep it simple, stupid or keep it simple, something else. Um, and simplicity is the order of the day. You want things to be really simple on the Camino. The simpler things are, the less likely they are to break, the, the more useful they are. Uh, and, and you wanna keep things, you don't need that fancy thing of a jig that you're thinking about taking. Thou shalt not take anything made of cotton. Now I know that I will get an argument from some of our panelists about this, um, and uh, uh, but uh, I, and and I and I happen to violate this uh, every now and then myself. Uh, but the problem with cotton is it doesn't dry. Uh, if you get it wet, if you perspire uh, or you wash it, it it really dries very very slowly, uh, and it also gets heavy. Don't wear, don't take jeans, no matter what you do. Don't take jeans when they get wet. They weigh a ton, and they take forever to dry. Uh, I see people with jeans on the Camino and I say, oh my God, don't do that. All of your fabric should be high-tech fabrics. Um, uh, and, and, you know, nylon or whatever it is that, that, uh, that, uh, that, that you get these days. Um, so cotton is a very poor choice. Now, I will tell you that I violate this rule. I, uh, I take a pair of cotton socks to wear in the evening at the end of the day uh, when I really want to get out of those trekking socks and those trekking shoes. And I take a cotton t-shirt to sleep in at night. Uh, but um, that's because it's comfortable and uh, because I get a rash sometimes if I, if I use a, a, a techie fabric when I'm sleeping. So uh, I, I violate this rule, but try not to. Let's put it this way. Try not to violate it. You can buy anything you forgot on the Camino. Believe me. The Spanish are very, very happy to separate you from your euros. You know, uh, they will bend over backwards to, oh, Stacey, you are, you want, uh, you want this? Yes, right here. You know, and and uh, they'll be they'll be very happy to help you with with whatever it is. You can buy anything you want that uh, that you forgot on on the Camino. Water, you can't do without it, and paper, you can do without it. Are very heavy. A liter of water weighs a kilo, and a kilo is 2.2 pounds. And you generally want to start every day with at least a liter of water. And if it's going to be a really hot day, maybe two liters of water. That's a lot of weight, okay? But you don't have any choice because you don't want to pass out when you're, when you're walking. Paper, that paperback book that you want to take, you know, uh, War and Peace, how thick is that, like this? I, I wonder how much War and Peace weighs. But... Um, don't uh, don't take it with you, or if you're going to take it, take a Kindle version of it. Um, but um, uh, I, I've actually found in my travels that I read very little when I'm there. I I'm, I'm so tired at the end of the day that I just want to go to sleep, uh, and there's too many other interesting things to do than to sit in a corner and read a book. So I, I read the travel brochures that I pick up and those things, but it's very rare that I that I that I will actually will read a novel. But they're very heavy. Water's heavy and paper are heavy. 
So be cognizant of that. We carry our fears in our backpack. I don't know who said this to me. Some, some pilgrim said this. And basically it means that we, we worry about something happening. And we ask, well, what if fill in whatever you want after that happens? Uh, then I, And if that happens, then I will need something or other. Well, first, it's not going to happen, most likely. Second, if it does happen, there are plenty of stores there where you can get what you need. Pharmacies are every place. So if you're worried about a medical issue, uh, you know, you, you could get what you need there. Uh, and um, don't be fearful. You don't, you don't have to, you don't have to worry about it. You know, there's, don't play the what if game. Uh, I, I think that's something that you want to try to try to avoid in packing your backpack. There are many right ways to do the Camino. I don't know if someone, another pilgrim told me this. What I do is one thing. What Lori does is something else. What uh, Sharon, uh, Susan does is something else. They're all, we're, we're all right. There's nothing, there's nothing wrong with anything that we do. Nothing whatsoever. Uh, and um, all of them are right ways to do it. And by the time you've done this, you will have a right way of doing it. So don't worry about whether what you're doing is, is the right way of doing things. And you don't have to follow. You don't have to do what your friends do either. You can do... Um, uh, something completely different than what your friends do, and it can be just as right as anything else. So those are what I call the maxims, uh, and I, I, I encourage you to think about those when you're when you're packing. Um, probably the most important one is less is more. So just take take less stuff. You'll be much happier with that. So we're going to have a panel now, and the panels consist of Susan Alcorn and Lori Ferris and Scott Williams. Um, and I'll, I'll chime in with a few words here, here, here and then. Uh, but just before we do this, can we just have uh, one minute from each one of you about your Camino experience? Susan, what's your Camino experience? We have, uh, Ralph and I have done uh, 18 trips on Camino um, rails. And we started with the Francais. Didn't realize we were going to go back, but we started going back and then we we uh, subsequently did the Le Puy route out of France. Uh, we've also done the Arles route from France. We've done the, um, uh, we just finished the Vézelay last year. We've done most of them except for the Francais in sections. We've also done the Norte and the Primitivo in um, Northern Spain and a little bit of the Mazarab, which is Southern Spain um, and the uh, Portuguese route from Porto. So altogether, we've done about 3,400 Camino miles. And haven't you also done, haven't, uh, Susan, haven't you also done the W in, in um, Patagonia? Oh, well, uh, yes. <laughs> we have done all of the Pacific Crest Trail, and we've done the circuit route, which includes the W route in Patagonia. Uh, we've also hiked in um, Antarctica, and uh, we hike a lot, lot here locally in the Bay Area. So there's, there's a real experienced pilgrim. Uh, don't listen to what I say. Listen to what she says. It will be much more um, um, factual than me. Lori, how about you? How much have you walked? Okay, I've walked four Caminos, um, relatively short. Two have been one-week Caminos and two have been two-week Caminos. Um, I carried my pack for three out of the four. And um, for one of those, I used a bag forwarding service because I was with a big group of people and we had our um, accommodations all pre-planned. So I went with the, the flow with everybody else and did backpack forwarding. Um, since I've done both, I have to say I prefer carrying my own back back. Um, so uh, my challenge now is I want to pack lighter than I ever have before because I have some knee injuries that have sprung up over the last year. And so um, that I'm striving to do everything that Rob had suggested in his slides and even more so with some changes that I make in my pack this time. Yeah, I, I, uh, I remember one time I was walking into Santiago on the Portuguese and I had hurt my leg. I had a ace bandage wrapped around my leg and I limped, I remember the last 13 kilometers I limped into Santiago. And when I got in there, I looked around, half the people in Santiago had a bandage wrapped around a limb someplace, a leg or an arm or a wrist. Yeah, so, I can, uh, I got that right here. I got Yeah. <laughs> my knee brace. Yeah, yeah. So 
uh, be prepared to walk injured. Um, it, it's, it often happens. So Scott Williams, where are you? I'm right here. Great, Scott. And I am primarily a long distance um, hiker who found the Camino midway uh, in my long distance career. I've done the Pacific Crest Trail, Continental Divide, Appalachian Trail, Te Araroa in New Zealand, uh, Israel's National Trail, uh, trekked in Madagascar. Oh, and, uh, and this summer actually no, no, we'll be doing the Camino Portuguese and um, as well as hiking the coasts of Ireland and the Kungsleden through Lapland and Sweden and um, the Lofoten Islands in Norway. So I'll be over there for four months coming up soon. But um, in 2014, I was on the Appalachian Trail when my wife called me on a really hard, hard day. That's a very hard trail, actually. Most people think it's at the beginning trail. It's not, it's really hard. And she says, how about we do the Camino next year? And I said, sweetie, don't tease me. This is a really hard day. She has never been interested in hiking hundreds and hundreds of miles. And she said, no, I'm serious. And she spent the year training when I got back. We had trained all winter long and came back and did the Francaise and absolutely loved it. I fell in love with the whole experience. Um, you trade wilderness on the trails I'm used to for medieval villages, for amazing art and architecture. And you trade the, the aloneness on our long trails for hiking with hundreds of the most interesting people you've ever met. So it was a marvelous experience all around. So I'm, a, a, like I say, heading off on the uh, Camino Portuguese in, uh, actually we'll be leaving in about seven days <laughs> to go to Europe. That's, that's great, Scott. And as I told you, I'll be doing the Portuguese uh, and I <laughs> hope that I, I run into you uh, there. I'll send you my itinerary and uh, we'll see if we, can, if we can get together because that would be um, a, great, a great experience. So, sounds like fun. <laughs> yeah, sounds like fun. So folks, so you can see we've got a, 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 a panel here that's really quite varied, lots of experiences, lots of knowledge about equipment, uh, and uh, so we're going to hear from them. So uh, first, I just want to put this up here about what is the well-dressed pilgrim, okay? And you can fit yourself into this. So back in the Middle Ages, this was the well-dressed pilgrim. So I don't expect any of you to dress like this, um, but I think it's, uh, I think it's uh, interesting. Uh, and uh, today, of course, this is the well-dressed pilgrim. This is from the Pilgrimage Museum in Santiago, which I encourage you to visit when you're in Santiago. I think it's, I think it's great. So um, you don't need a staff, you don't need a cape, you don't need that. You need more of what this guy on the right here has. All right, so what are we gonna do here? Uh, I'm gonna present a packing topic uh, and I'm gonna ask a question about the topic and have different people on the panelists, on the pan different panelists answer it. And we'll repeat this for all the topics. And again, we'll save the, the questions till the end. Okay, so just let me tell you, I think the three most important pieces of equipment on the Camino are the footwear, socks, and backpack, and we're gonna start with that. So I'll stop sharing right now. Please, there we go. With footwear, we have to be concerned about what you wear when you walk, and then also what you wear when you aren't walking, because that's an important part of the day. And there's lots of options for walking, high top boots, low top boots, et cetera. And we're gonna hear about, oh, back, back one, please. You went too far. There we go. Okay, uh, you're going to hear about uh, some of these from from the panelists about what they what they they walk in and then what they wear in the evening. So the first one we're going to pick on Scott here. Okay, um, one of the most common shoes used in long distance hiking nowadays. Uh, there's a lot of different options. Is the Ultra A L T R A Lone Peak? It's their uh, trail runner shoes. Um, a lot of people start out the Camino in boots. I highly, highly recommend against it. Uh, you don't need it. It's not that difficult to trail. And within the first, oh gosh, three, four weeks, I was doctoring people's feet every single night in the Albuges uh, with horrible blisters, horrible things happening to their feet. They hadn't broken in boots properly. If you do hike in boots and you think you need that ankle support, which actually is a bit of a Ankle support comes from being low, not being high up. A ski boot gives you ankle support, but you can't hike in a ski boot. And, uh, but anyway, low top, um, non-waterproof so that it dries quickly. Waterproof shoes take a long, long time to dry. Here's another option, uh, Topo. I'm gonna try this, it's a wicked color, uh, but it also 
like the ultra, you see they're almost like duck feet. They've got really wide toe box. Uh, everybody's feet are going to grow. They grow daily and they grow over time if you actually do a lot of miles. Uh, I was at nine and a half when I began long trail hiking about 13 years ago. I'm now a 12 and a half to 13. Your feet literally grow. But on trail, they grow every day from morning to about noontime. And at noontime, I would have people that literally couldn't walk in the shoes they'd started with. One wonderful woman from Australia we hiked with for quite a while would get to noon and she just couldn't go further. Her $250 boots, we had to cut the whole side off of them so that her feet could expand out the side until she could get to, I think in Leon, she got uh, a new pair of lightweight shoes. But no, actually she did the whole Camino. She put duct tape over to keep stuff from coming inside. But your feet swell as you walk. So get your shoes half a size to a full size bigger than you think you need because uh, they will swell day after day. I use on that little list that uh, Rob started me with, Dirty Girl Gators. Uh, they come in a little bag like this. Uh, you can get them online, but they're little spandex things that come in all kinds of crazy colors that fit with a little piece of Velcro on the back of your shoe and they hook to the front of your shoe on the lace and they just keep junk out. If you're walking in low top shoes, you need something like that um, to keep the junk out. As far as off trail, tennis shoes are so comfortable that I simply use the tennis shoes in town when I'm on the, the Camino. I don't have a second pair of shoes. I try to go light. For showering, I bring a pair of, of flip-flops or around the albergues, I'll wear this. But if I go out into town, even if they're wet, I put on my shoes. I'm with Rob, what he said, a pound is a lot. Over hundreds of miles, every single pound is tremendous <laughs> and really weighs you down. So, and for socks, um, just, some basic REI uh, low top is what I like um, because I've got the gaiters to really actually cover the lower part of my my leg. So that is my shoe thing. <laughs> Scott, um, uh, I missed that. I was taking notes here. Would you please put the name of that first shoe that you had in the chat window so oh. that people could could uh, uh, because you 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 went through that pretty fast. Well, I'll so, give it real fast. Ultra A L T R A. Low okay. Peak is the model. They're the most common, but there are others. There are several others. And whatever shoe you get, um, try it out ahead of time, a lot ahead of time. The, the key to not getting blisters and not getting foot problems is to walk and walk and walk some more before you go on your Camino. Don't expect to go on your Camino and get fit and get in shape. Try to do that. Camino is a wonderfully spiritual, lovely experience. And a lot of people go there thinking, that will carry them through. But it's 95% profoundly physical. And I, I watched too many people leaving trail in tears, uh, just you know, halfway through or three quarters through, and their knees had given out, their hips, their feet. Uh, and it's because of not training ahead of time. Don't overtrain, but definitely start walking ahead of time. You need to like to walk every single day to do a long trail. And the Camino is a long trail. So A-L-T-R-A is a real popular one, but I found this recently, T-O-P-O, -O, Topo. It has the same wide toe box. I've never used them, uh, but I'm going to this year and uh, gonna try those out. Thank you, Scott. Uh, Lori, what about you? Okay, well, I, um, I have a pair of ultra low tops as well, but what I've used on the Camino and I'm happy with is this, um, Adidas, Terex, Swift, um, three-quarter ankle height, um, kind of a, a boot type of thing. It's Gore-Tex, but yet it's breathable and it gives me good support and it has good traction. Um, and I like the quick laces. Um, putting on your shoes, it's, it's a process. I mean, I use to prevent blisters, I use um, something like a Vicks vapor rub kind of thing, um, or you can use Vaseline. And then I put my socks on and my socks are, I like the um, Darn Tough brand, Merino wool. And then you have to remember if you're gonna use gators, dirty girl gators, Merino. you put those on Merino. next. And I'm gonna show because somebody, somebody asked to see the gators again. Um, I learned about these from Scott as well. So um, these were designed by uh, women trail runners. 
Here's the Velcro that goes to the back and here's the hook that goes to your laces. So you have to remember to put these on before you put your shoe on. So um, the quick laces saves me a little time and um, I'm happy with these. I, I think I have one more Camino in them, even though um, <laughs> there's some a little bit of tread is gone, but um, yeah. So darn tough socks, dirty girl gaiters, Adidas for me. And then my other shoe, my leisure shoe, <laughs> where'd they go? Oh, here they are, are these zero shoes. They are like thinner, lighter weight versions of Tevas. And the brand is X-E-R-O, it's pronounced zero. And they're really good tread and I could take them in showers. I've actually walked with my full pack um, a couple miles with these after dipping my feet in the shores on my Camino Inglés and so I had salty, somewhat sandy feet. And I just walked to the albergue in these with my pack and it was, I felt it had enough support for me. Um, and they're great. They've held up really well over four Caminos. Susan, how about you? Well, guess what? Ultra, long beak. <laughs> um, on our first Camino, I wore boots and I had we had literally come off the John Muir Trail where I was wearing these and they were fine. Get over there and I'm having blister problems constantly. Uh, so, and I've weighed these today. These are 20, out, 20 ounces per, whereas the Ultra is 10 ounces per shoe. So that's a big difference right there. If, uh, and I also have often uh, in the, I've also worn the Topo, by the way, Scott. Um, I, I had plantar fasciitis for a while, and so I needed to get a custom made orthotic. And I wore that for quite a while. And then uh, eventually that all went away, but I still wanted something a little more substantial than the standard thing inside the shoe. So I take that out and I just bought these, but I have another pair I'm actually using. These are made by, um, these are called Power Step. And they come in different designs. You don't really need to have a camouflage version, but that is an insert you can put in if you want to replace what comes standard. And if I'm going to be on a really uh, rocky trail or something, I want a little extra padding, then I order some kind of uh, foam pad insert. Now the Dr. Scholl's I found don't hold up at all, but there's another brand, um, Oh shoot, no, I can't remember. There's one that's a closed form, uh, foam that you can get and it real, uh, it's not very deep. So you can put it in and then you can put whatever else you want on top of it, just to give you a little more cushion if you want it. So I, um, I'm i very happy with the Ultra. I was very happy with the Topo. I don't take a second pair of shoes um, for on the trail necessarily, but because we often fly into you know, Paris or Madrid or whatever, and I do care about fashion, Robert. <laughs> <laughs> go for it, Susan. <laughs> I like to be able to go out in something a little more than a, you know, so I take these uh, Mephisto sandals, and these have been on every Camino I've ever been on, and uh, so that kind of lets me, me dress up, but I don't wear these on the Camino very much. I, uh, I guess I either keep my, well, I keep on my, uh, my regular trail runners when I'm wandering around town because they're, you know, they're not uncomfortable. Uh, as far as socks, I actually use um, a brand that, I don't know if you can find them anymore. These are Tilly socks and they're, that's the same company that makes those hats. I think they're in Australia, am I, am I right? Yeah, a lot of people wear the uh, Topo, I'm sorry, the um, Tilly hats. And this oh, is oh, a yeah. company. And these are an acrylic, very lightweight, I've tried everything from, you know, two layers of socks to occasionally I do wear the, um, the, the right socks, which are two layers, because those of you who have tried putting on a liner sock and the other sock over it, it's a pain in the neck. This combines them and it's a little heavier and you can get these in different ways if you want more weight. Um, also, I do. I have bunions, which is part of why I wear the topos and the um, ultra. 
because they have the wider toe box. And I also have often, as many women hikers do, uh, purchase the men's rather than the women's because they have more width of them and so on. But anyway, I don't carry a full roll, but I do carry this special breathable tape. And if I think I'm gonna be having problems or am having problems, you can wrap this stuff around your toe and you don't really need to be very neat, but you can wrap it around your toe and it um, prevents you know, excess abrasion. And sometimes I also take some of this, not the whole roll, obviously. This is Omniflix, Omnifix. And um, I wrap it around kind of the, my foot all the way around the bunion area, just to not let that area get, um, get irritated. So I don't take the whole roll, but I just wanted to show you what it what it looks like. And it just peels off. It's got a backing here. And uh, you cut it to size, and then you take the backing off and wrap it around. And I don't, you know, I don't have to replace it every day, every maybe three days or something. It gets a little waterlogged or a little dirty, and then you change it. But I have found it very helpful in preventing blisters. Yeah, I've used that that too, Susan. Um, let me let me do my thing very, very quickly here. I happen to be the uh, the the naysayer in the group. Um, I actually wear boots in all of my almost all my caminos. I wear low top boots like this. These are keen. I have wide feet, and so I need I need the width up here. In fact, even with the wide toe box up here, I still stretch them out to give uh, more more width. Uh, and um, so and I do like the ankle support that they give me. I know what Scott says that that you need a ski boot to really get ankle support. Uh, and so maybe this doesn't give me ankle support, but it makes me feel like I have ankle support. You know, it's, it's a psychological thing. Uh, also, if I'm walking through mud or water, that mud or water generally does not get into my, my boot. And I've done lots of that <clears throat> where I've had to go through uh, puddles and streams and things like that. Um, and what I really like about these is the, the sole. Uh, uh, and what I, what I don't like about the shoes that you guys have recommended is that they don't have this good thick sole. There's lots of cobblestones on the Camino and I don't like to feel them through my sole. I, I like to, I don't like to feel them. So I like a good thick sole on the bottom and I also like it to be non-skid. So I've got this vibrant sole here. I don't know exactly what it is, uh, but uh, that keeps me from slipping around and it also keeps the the um, the rocks from coming up through my sole, my foot. Now, this is what I walked almost all of my Caminos. Lately, however, uh, I have transitioned to a low cut version of it. It's exactly the same shoe, but it's low cut. So it's a little bit cooler than the other one. And I find that it's adequate for what I'm doing. Still has that great sole on the bottom, which I love uh, and um, doesn't give me the ankle support or the appearance of ankle support but it does give me a lot of support around my instep in here. I do get a size that's a, that's a full size or size and a half larger than what I normally wear. I think these are 12s and I normally wear about a 10 and a half. Um, and I do have an, a custom orthotic in these, one made by a, a podiatrist. They, they aren't cheap. It was about 350 bucks for a pair of, of custom orthotics, but boy, they have saved my feet. I have lots of foot problems, plantar fasciitis, and all sorts of other problems with, with my feet. Um, I use KT tape. I don't know if you are familiar with KT tape, but um, KT tape is a, a wonderful thing. I, I use it for plantar fasciitis. I've used it for all sorts of problems that I've had. And KT has videos. You can go online and you can watch their videos and they'll say, if your problem is plantar fasciitis, here's how you wrap it. If your problem is something else, here's how you wrap the KT tape. So I take some KT tape with me for wrapping myself up. For socks, um, I use, um, well, this is something I discovered a few Caminos ago. Um, I discovered Lurbel socks, L-U-R-B-E-L. -E uh, they're in the next slide there. Uh, they look like they look like this. Uh, there's actually a right and a left sock. This is an L left here. And then there's a right sock. It's the only sock I've ever owned where there is, that is asymmetric, where there's a right sock and a left sock. And they claim, uh, the Lurbell folks claim that with these, you will not get blisters. Uh, now, I, I, I have not, since I've been wearing these, had, had any blisters. 
Uh, and I, I would not get a lot of blisters, but I'd get uh, one or two per Camino. Uh, and, um, because I, and the reason I didn't get blisters in the past was because I had very large shoes uh, and I took care of my feet. Uh, but they claim that you won't get blisters with these. They also claim that if you get blisters, um, you just wear these over the blister, that you don't need to, need to treat it. Now, I haven't tried that before, but that's what, uh, that's what Lerbel folks uh, say. These are available in Spain, and some people have told me they found them on Amazon. Uh, I love Lerbel socks, uh, and so um, I, I highly recommend them. This is all that I wear uh, in, in terms of, of socks. Uh, I do wear, um, in the evening, I wear Tevis sandals uh, with a lightweight athletic sock, a cotton athletic sock to violate my own rules. Um, but it sure feels good to put that cotton sock on after wearing these all day long. You know, it's just such a such a relief. Take your shower and put on your cotton socks and your Tevis. Man, that's- Can that's, you hold that's... those up again, Robert, please? Sure. Now they, they come in all sorts of different designs and they also come in different heights okay here so the the name of these where's the uh, i don't know whether it says on the front someplace along here oh here we go uh, here's here's the name of it it's actually in my next slide but uh lurbel l-u-r-b-e-l uh you can uh i actually uh, i i was walking in uh, in spain and i you know there it is there and i was in um leon and I was having all sorts of foot problems. And a, a friend of mine from back here in the Bay Area said, oh, I found these Lerbel socks, they're great, you gotta try them. So I went to, a, there's a, right on the Camino in Leon, there's a, a, a Camino shop that looks just like REI, like a small REI. So I went in there and I said, do you have Lerbel socks? So oh, right here, senor. You know, I told you they're perfectly happy to separate you from your euros. And um, so he sold me a pair of these and I wore them around for the day. And I said, man, those are great. So I went back and bought two more pair for the rest of the Camino and basically threw away my other socks. So ever since I've discovered these, I don't wear anything else when I'm walking. Do you wear liners with them? No, there's no liners with these. This is a single layer sock. That's all it is, a single layer sock, okay? So one, one option, and this has been mentioned, this has been mentioned before is the two sock option. And I have done it before, where you have a thin inner sock and a thick outer sock. I used to do that. It's as someone pointed out, I can't remember Susan, it's a pain in the neck to put that on every day. Um, and so I finally gave up on that um, and um, went to just a single a single layer. And I found these uh, these things to be great, fantastic. So I don't know if they'll work for you, but they certainly have worked worked for me. Okay. Let's go, let's go 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 to the next slide, uh, um, Martin, please. Okay. Oh, oh so I forgot to say in the evening, I wear Tevis. Yeah. So socks, you've got your options of single or double socks, socks with sock liners, trekking socks, which are little bills. Oh, and when you order these, uh, you order them, uh, uh, they have different different styles for different things. If you want to play tennis, they have the little bill tennis socks. If you want to do biking, you have the little bill biking socks. These are the um, trekking socks, if I remember correctly. Some people go with no socks. Um, I, 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 uh, there's a, a pilgrim from the Bay Area who lives in um, uh, Port, uh, Port Ferrata right now. Uh, he, he goes, he, his, he has such bad feet that he wears Tevas whenever he walks and he wears for socks, he wears um, neoprene socks that he found someplace to keep his feet dry. But he, he's found that he cannot wear any shoes uh, because his feet are so bad. So anyway, okay, uh, let's go ahead. Uh, uh, then with backpacks. All right, who wants to start with backpacks here? Oh, let, let's get Lori on this because Lori's very proud of her new backpack. <laughs> yes. Um, so first of all, let me show you my old backpack laden with patches. <laughs> um, I'm one of many pilgrims who like putting patches, but um, this is an Osprey Cirrus 36. And uh, it has a frame and it has this air mesh thing. And, you know, I liked this. This was comfortable and it kept my back from getting too hot. Um, good quality zippers and everything. But this weighs 3.2 pounds. And as I've been hiking with long distance hiking 
um, people like Scott and, and going to some of these American Long Distance Hiker Association rucks uh, or gatherings, I've been learning a lot of tips from them. So um, I wanted to go lighter. My new backpack is a Gossamer Gear frameless pack. And um, this is, it serves kind of as a frame. It's a removable sit pad that comes out and it's lightweight, dense foam. Um, so I can take this out and, and use it as a sit pad, but it also provides a little bit of a structure in this pack. Um, and it has a really nice stretchy pocket here for putting either wet clothes or a jacket. And the sides, um, one of the side pockets is lower than the other. So, you know, in the lower side pocket, I would put my water bottle. And then the higher one, I might put my, my trekking poles or, I don't know, a bottle of wine or something. <laughs> uh, and then it has these zigzag stretch cords and a nice pocket, nice zipper pocket up here. And, oh yeah, and then um, I, I purchased this hands-free umbrella thing. I think we're gonna talk about the umbrellas later on, so I'll leave that out. But Gossamer Gear, this is a G420 brand. And how much does it, Lori, how much does it weigh? Uh, 0.8 pounds, hmm. 0 0.8. Wow. How, yeah. how many liters is it? It's a 40 liter capacity. And so I can, I'm gonna try to, you know, go by that 10% of my body weight or less. And then if I, um, you know, I like to bring snacks and everything and that weighs your pack down and I'll pack those in the top part of my pack or in this outer pouch here. But I mean, this is gonna be much lighter than my Osprey. So I look forward to breaking it in. And how many, yeah, times, just, how, many just... how many Caminos have you used your Osprey on with it? Um, Osprey. I use my Osprey for four Caminos. And wow. this, this coming mm -hmm. June, I'm going to be walking my fifth Camino, Camino Portuguese Coastal spiritual variant. And I just wanted to go lighter all the way around. Um, so I'm, I'll do a full on product review after I do my Camino and and uh, I'm doing my first Camino and I have the Osprey Cyrus 36. Well, it was a good pack. So, you know, go for it, but just stick to those rules. And, you know, like Rob said, less is more. So it was a, it was a nice backpack for me for years, but I just have this um, vibe to go ultra light this year. Susan, what do you wear? What do you take? Uh, I'm using the Osprey. Uh, 40. And, um, you know, I use it pretty much because I use it for any backpacking. I haven't really, I could reduce it, I think, to a smaller size. Um, I don't know if we'll get to it later, so I'm just going to show right now. Well, okay, so it's got this um, pouch in the front. It's got the side pockets. It has this lid which is waterproof. So if it looks like it's gonna be, you know, rainy, then um, I, I keep my, my rain gear in there handy. And it's got this inner pocket, which is also lined. So these are um, handy for things you wanna to get to easily and not have to dig through the rest of it. So I also line my backpack with a, um, a this is a trash compactor bag. And then I, separate my items inside into about three different lumps with these turkey baster bags. And as you probably can tell, they're a little noisy. So if you're gonna be doing that, uh, be considerate of the people that are staying where you're staying. Otherwise they're gonna be complaining about the noise, but they're certainly lightweight and uh, you don't have to spend a fortune on, you know, special packing, whatever they call them. So anyway, I, I'm interested in the one that um, Lori is talking about. Uh, Ralph and I used to carry uh, a go light pack that didn't have, uh, it was it was frameless like this new one that she talked about, but um, ours didn't have a nice uh, hip belt. 
And I think finding a good hip belt is important. So I'm, I'm going to be really interested in what Lori's trying out and Scott's going to be trying out. Okay, Scott, how about you? Uh, let's see. On my uh, the earlier Camino that I did, the Frances, I used um, a ULA, that's Ultra Light Adventures um, circuit. Uh, they do um, that, and they also have one called the CDT, which my wife used. That's a frameless pack. The circuit has a little bit of a bar. I don't have it here because it's not what I'm using this year, but uh, it's about a two pound pack, and I was carrying a lot of gear uh, on that one. Uh, this year, I'll be using a Z-Pack um, Arc Blast, which has got a few miles on it. And this is made out of Cuban fiber. So even though this is a framed pack, it's got two stays up the back, along with a mesh thing there and a little bit across the top. Uh, actually, I could pull that all out and it would be okay as a frameless, but it's still just around a pound. Uh, it's a very lightweight pack for a large pack. This one, I think, is 55 liters. And I've got to be carrying some of the gear that I'll be using in Scandinavia later on. So I'm going to have more stuff than just my Camino. Uh, and, but the beauty of these is just how light and how well designed they are. Um, Z-Pax is the company, and they put out a lot of, of um, packs made out of what's now called Dyneema, what used to be Cuban fiber. It's now called Dyneema. It's one of the strongest um, kind of almost bulletproof fabrics in the world um, and very, very light. Uh, this pack, I do the same thing as Susan and line it with a garbage compactor bag because even though I take a little bit of extra weight in that I bring a pack cover. So in here is a pack cover that I will put, if it rains, I'll cover this whole thing with the pack cover. Now the pack cover won't keep water from getting in the pack, but it keeps water out of, this big outside pouch is what I live from all, all day long. I'm in and out of my pockets and this big thing here. I very rarely actually open my pack up during the day. This will keep that dry. And then this will ensure that anything inside my pack stays dry. And then I go one extra step because I'm a kayaker as well. And I use a Sea to Summit Nanotech. It's their lightest. Um, a uh, waterproof bag. And I will have my uh, sleeping gear in this, my clothing in this kind of stuff. Anything that matters about getting wet, I put in there just because I'm paranoid. I uh, don't like to have wet gear. And I also bring about an ounce and a half, I think it is, it's a Sea to Summit, a little teeny day pack. And this folds up into that little bag. So it's a tiny thing most of the time. And it weighs almost nothing. But I use this when I go into town and I'm buying, you know, lunch for the next day, some of the cheeses and some bread or whatever. Um, and it's just good because I can put things in it. I can carry it in my hand or on my back. So I actually always have two packs on a Camino. And uh, I also you'll notice here have safety pins off the back because you're always washing clothes every night and you're hanging them off the back of your pack. I'll have more than two by the time I get going. But that's what I'm using this year. It's a, a Z-Pax Arc Blast. Thank you, Scott. Well, I'm. Uh, uh, this is my pack here. Uh, I, I've used it on all of my communities. It's a Gregory. It's a 40 liter. And and uh, if you, you you will not need anything larger than 40 liters. If uh, even though Scott needs it because of his particular requirements, but if you're just walking the watching the Camino, then 40 liters is plenty of space. My wife walked with a 34 liter one and she had plenty of space in hers. So you don't need a very big one. Uh, this is a nice pack. I think it weighs two pounds, 10 ounces, if I remember correctly. So it's not a, it's considered a lightweight pack, but it's not an ultra light, light pack. Uh, it's got lots of, you know, the usual pockets and all that type of stuff in it. So it's a, uh, where, did, where did my screen go? Uh, so it's, it's, uh, you know, it, it's a, uh, fine in terms of where to put things and so forth and outside pockets for the water and, and all of that. It comes with a built-in um, rain fly. Down here at the bottom, you unzip this and out here comes a rain fly. So this is one thing I like about Gregory is they give you a rain fly uh, that, uh, that works pretty well. Uh, and um, 
So, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I like that. Uh, I haven't had any of the difficulties with water that these other folks have described. Uh, I, uh, I found the rainfly works fine. Uh, I, don't, I don't pack my clothes in plastic bags uh, inside the um, backpack. Uh, maybe I just stay out of the rain. I don't know. Maybe I'm, you know, when it starts to rain, I say, oh, that's, that's enough for me. Although I have been in, in plenty of rain before. Uh, but I do, I do, I have pulled out the rain fly a number of times and it, it covers the pack very nicely. Uh, and I've never had any problems with it. It has a pouch in the bottom here for, for sleeping gear. So the sleeping gear can go down in here. Uh, it's got, uh, you know, all of the usual sort of stuff in it uh, for, um, uh, for putting your, putting your stuff and multiple pockets for, for zippers. So I, I've, I've walked long distances on this. It's uh, showing a little wear, but not much. I've never had anything break on it. Uh, I like Gregory. I think they're they're a good company. Um, so uh, it's one, one another option. And when I went to when I bought this, <coughs> I was at REI, and I I, I said, uh, uh, you know, I don't know what pack to get. Can I try some on? And there happened to be an Osprey representative and a Deuter representative there, uh, and they said, all right, let's see what fits you. Fit is really important. So uh, they tried on all of these different packs, and, and including this one here, and loaded it up with their stuff that they have at REI. And they both agreed that this one fit me the most, fit me the best. So even though it wasn't their product, they recommended this, and I've been happy with it. It is framed uh, in the back. Here, it has this frame. I like the frame because what the frame does, Scott will probably scream at me about this, is it transfers the weight to your hips. Uh, and you don't want to carry the weight on your shoulders. Uh, uh, you, you want to carry the weight on your hips. So I have a, a good hip build here and, um, and a frame uh, like this. But it's still considered to be a relatively lightweight pack. It's not like one of these big 60 liter packs that, that weighs you know, six pounds or whatever it is. So I've been perfectly happy with this on all of the Caminos that I've, that I've, that I've done. Um, all right, so that's that's my choice of, of packs right now. Um, oh, and I also have, I also have that little tiny uh, pack that that Scott pulled out. It's a Sea to Summit, and I have I take that with me. And when I go into town at the end of the day, I pull it out. I put my sweater or whatever I need for the evening in that, and and carry that around. It's it's a it's a wonderful little thing. Sea to Summit is a brand that I highly recommend for these types of things. They have all sorts of little, little doodads that you can get that are, that are de definitely worthwhile uh, looking into. Okay, so that does it for packs. So anyway, so framed or frameless 40 liter rule, the 10% rule, I just let me just mention that. The general rule is that you should not carry in your backpack more than 10% of your body weight. Now I wanna modify that slightly. I want it to be 10% of what your ideal body weight is, not your, your overstuffed body weight. I, I, I weigh quite a bit more uh, than I should. I should weigh 170 pounds. So I should carry no more than 17 pounds. I weigh a few more pounds than that. I won't explain what it is, but that's about what I carry is 17 pounds. Um, you want to stay within your, 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 um, you know, what's, what's that chart that we get that, says what our, our body weight should be, you should stay within that. Um, and, um, uh, and that's the 10% rule. Uh, my wife used to carry, my wife was a little tiny woman when she was walking, uh, she used to carry about uh, 12 pounds. Uh, and she got by just fine. She had a 34 liter uh, Gregory that was just fit her just really nicely. Pack pack alternatives, you can, you can always drag a um, carry on behind you. I've seen all sorts of strange stuff on the Camino, you know, wheeled things and so forth. Boy, is it weird. And there's luggage transport services. They've already been mentioned here. Uh, you can uh, drop your bag uh, at the front desk of the albergue, fill out a little form, uh, leave five euros in it. And uh, when you get to your next location, your backpack will be there. I've used it a number of times. So you don't have to carry your own backpack. I like to, but, but some people don't. Anyway, ten percent of ten uh, percent inside your backpack, or ten percent? No, no, ten percent. The, the the weight of your backpack, including its contents. 
Including the no backpack. Than, including the backpack. No more than 10% of your body weight. It's what you carry. Now that does not include water and does not include food. I add those to it. So your backpack, uh, the backpack and the clothes in it, everything in it except water and food um, uh, and war and peace, you know, or whatever novel you're going to take with you, but it does include your electronics. So I, I, I include all of that stuff in there. Now, as you walk, you'll carry more stuff in your pockets and less stuff in your pockets. So on a very, very hot day, that backpack's going to be heavier. On a colder day, that back, backpack is going to be less because you're going to be wrapping up in, in, in whatever you, the cold weather stuff is. So think of sort of an average of about 10% of your body weight and shoot, shoot for that. You'll be, you'll be much happier. Any other uh, questions? Okay. So luggage transfer services, you can mail things to Santiago and so forth. All right, let's go on to the next slide. Now there's, we've hit the biggies, which are shoes, socks, and backpacks. Now there's all sorts of other stuff. And we're, we're, we're running a little bit low on time now, it's five. So there's sun protection, rain gear, sleeping gear, trekking poles, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So why don't what we do now is I will go to one of these and I'll ask one person to tell me what they do. Uh, and but not all three, um, and uh, we'll we'll go down the list like that. So let's go to sun protection. Who wants to tell us about sun protection? I'm going to call her Susan. She looks like she needs sun protection. Susan, what do you use? I should have done it much earlier. <laughs> well, well, well I, I do that because of your light complexion. Let's see. Uh, yeah, sunscreen's very important. So yeah, this yeah. Is, I normally carry about. Well, you can only carry what, three ounces, so that's what this is. Um, there have been times I needed more of that kind of thing, and I found it rather difficult to find a, um, a reasonable size. Um, mm -hmm. I wanted to point out that since we hike mainly uh, on other trails than the Francais, so we don't have the infrastructure that the mm -hmm. Camino Francais does in a lot of places. We may hike you know, 10 miles before we see anything mm -hmm. and that anything may not have a, a store in it. So uh, you do kind of need to make some, some alterations or changes in, in your gear, depending on the route that you're gonna be on. Um, I, wanted, I wanted to skip back to the, to the backpack and so on. I also carry a, um, um, the, the bags I showed you are for inside. To keep things dry, and I do have the uh, the cover that Osprey puts out, and my sleeping bag and down jacket are wrapped in one of those plastic um, uh, turkey baster bags at the very bottom of my backpack, so they they stay dry because yeah, that's really important. But anyway, sun protection. Uh, oh yes, umbrellas. Umbrella. <laughs> I actually have two of them. Uh, I also have one that folds, and these are great for both sun and rain. So I, I have one too. Pardon? I have one also. Uh, one time, uh, my pole, I, I, I lost my pole, and so I was scouting to find something that was equally light. If you want to get something other than a hiker umbrella, you need to look real carefully to find one that is a reasonable weight. These are, you know, less... I think it's, uh, what, eight ounces? Something like that, yes. Maybe a little less. And this one's a little bit more, but actually easier to put up. And uh, I also am in the process of, <laughs> Laura showing me another color. <laughs> I also am going to put on those things that you can hold it so you can have your hands both free to for your hiking poles and all that. Um, yeah, Lori, you said that you bought something for attaching it to your to your backpack. Is that correct? No, oh, I'd like to see, sometime I'd like to see what that Sorry. is. Yeah, um, Yeah. so uh, Gossamer Gear has this clip that um, will attach this umbrella to my backpack strap. Um, and I, I also learned about this through Scott. Um, and this really does keep you cool. Um, it, it feels like you have your own personal air conditioning when you're walking in the sun and you're under one of these, um, they're chrome domes. If this is the same brand that Susan and Scott and probably you have Rob, yeah. but um, it is a challenge to secure it so you can be hands-free and hold your poles, right? Your trekking poles. So that's why this little clip is gonna be essential. And um, when I get that on and, you know, I'll, I'll share photos and I'll put this in my 
packing presentation in my refined packing list blog post. But um, I, 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 I attach mine to my strap with a little bungee cord that I have. Okay. That I bought at uh, REI, but it's the same thing, same concept. Well, and actually, since we're on umbrellas, let me give you one more technique for, for holding it down. Uh, it doesn't work for everybody, but it, it uh, what I do is just to put the strap under my chest strap. Now, if you're a large chested woman, sometimes it, you can't get it tight enough to really hold it there. And at the bottom of my umbrella, I've got a carabiner. And the carabiner is attached to this slide. There's This comes with the umbrella. You put the, put the carabiner on. This hooks to your belt, your belly band, and it allows you to move the umbrella around as wind changes. If, if it's locked in place, and that the thing is locking it in place with the little uh, clips that Lori has is wonderful if there's no wind, absolutely wonderful. But when the wind comes up, you need to be able to shift this so you're angling into the wind and or take it down if it's a big wind. But I've actually gone through hurricanes in New Zealand, and this became part of my, my clothing, really, just blown up against you, keeping the upper part of your body dry, which as long as your breathable raincoat is dry, you're still, it's still breathing. Once it gets saturated on the outside, it no longer breathes, and you get really clammy inside. So this keeps it relatively dry. But by being able to move that carabiner to one side and hook it to my pack here, or really quickly slip it over to there. I can, you know, go down a switchback. I can change direction. I can move around in big winds. So anyway, that, but that's another way to, to hook it. And not everybody can do that, but a lot of people do. And that's a, a pretty common way to, to deal with an umbrella. I want to add that I, I, I love your suggestion, um, that I, after I bought the Chrome umbrellas, I took it out on the back deck and I put a thermometer under it and it, you know, and there was a there was a difference, a measurable difference when it was under the umbrella and when it was not under the umbrella. And also, like I said, I have a I bought just a, another umbrella one time when I could, you know, when I lost this one, and uh, I had to look hard to find something even this light. But it doesn't have the advantage of the reflective thing. And so I measured the difference between that and this and none. And, it, and you know, it was a few, a few degrees. So it's not just all in your head that it works. Um, I so, to somebody, asked, somebody asked how much that umbrella costs. They are not cheap. They're about $50. No, they're not so cheap. Be yeah. prepared. But um, I, I have two. I use them too. Uh, also, if I'm going to be hiking, like if you're on the Maserov or one of the trails that is, you know, middle of summer and you really want protection for your hands, I didn't want to pay a huge amount for gloves. So I went to the gardening section <laughs> and I got some cloth gloves that I wore when I was out there, you know, in, in the broiling sun for quite a while. So that's kind of an optional thing, but just a suggestion. And then I like the Sunday um, afternoon's hat. Oh, yeah. So, You'll see a lot of them on the trail. The Tilly had a similar, but it's heavier. So I like this. And when I'm not uh, wearing it and I want to sit, I sit on it. It's pretty waterproof also. So I've had this hat for years. It's very easy. That's yeah, you, you, will need a, you will need a sun hat. Everybody should have a sun hat. I have a big one, big broad one like that. Not quite like hers, but, but similar. Uh, uh, what's next on the list? I've forgotten, uh, Martin. Where are we here? There was, there's rain gear. Can, can, can we see my slide again, Martin, please? Okay, we got rain gear down, sleeping gear, trekking poles, hydrates. Oh, sleeping gear. God, I hate to, I hate to open it up to sleeping gear. The, that, that, that starts a whole can of worms, but let's see if we can keep the, 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 the worms in the can as, as, as much as we can. So um, sleeping gear. So your options, Next, next slide, please. Uh, your options on sleeping gear are none, none. Uh, next one, please. Um, um, a sleep sheet, both, a quilt, none of the above. I will tell you what I take, uh, and that's a quilt. I, I found a quilt made by Sea to Summit, weighs 13 ounces. It has a zipper that goes all the way around it, um, and uh, it's down. And I think it's I think it's great. I love it. Um, but anyway, what do you what do you take, uh, 
Okay, how about Scott? I haven't picked on him for a while. Okay, I think I'm got there. Um, well, first thing is I take a sheet on the Camino and it's a very lightweight uh, fabric I found in a remainders section of Britex in San Francisco. Uh, cut it to the size so that it will hang over the bed uh, if I'm, because you're staying in albergues and bed bugs are an issue. And I soak it before leaving in permethrin and hang it out to dry. And permethrin, if there's anything, I mean, we treated our backpacks, sprayed our backpacks, sprayed everything that might just be laying around an albergue because somebody else may have brought in the little jingatas and you didn't, weren't prepared for it. It will repel them. We had no problems by using this. So what I do is I come into an albergue, I lay this sheet across the bed. And then on top of that, I have like Rob, a very ultralight down. It's basically a quilt. Um, this is a Z-Pax. And this is a summer quilt that they make, but it's, I think it's a 35 or 40 degree quilt. So it's, it's built for summer, which is fine inside an albergue. But I lay on my sheet with my pillowcase over the pillow, which has also been treated. And permethrin is made out of a chemical that's based on something in chrysanthemums. And we can eat chrysanthemums. Once this has dried, the solvents that are in this are highly toxic and you don't wanna get them into the environment. They have to you know, evaporate out when you're using this stuff. But what's left doesn't hurt humans, and but it is deadly for bed bugs and mosquitoes and all that stuff. So anyway, I use a combination of a sheet and a very lightweight quilt. But then every night I've got my own stuff on me. And that feels nice when you, you know, it's a little questionable. You're going to stay in some questionable places sometimes and you just feel better about it. How about... Uh... Uh, Let's uh, that, that's that's enough for now. Well, let's let's move on to the next one. We can't we can't dwell. That's a good suggestions. Uh, what's the next one, Martin? Down there after uh, sleeping um, sleep sheet. Yeah, trekking poles. Oh yes. Um, well, let me just say this: take trekking poles. Uh, I think you're crazy not to take trekking poles. Uh, there's lots of places. Do any of you not take trekking poles, Scott? You do. I know. Absolutely. Susan, do you take trekking poles? Sure. Lori, do you yeah. take trekking? You betcha. Yeah, I I, uh, uh, I think trekking poles, they have saved my butt a number of times. What's that? Well, this is the package. Right now, uh, REI has their trekking poles in. And if mm -hmm. you don't have trekking poles, please go out and buy these. I've used them in Madagascar, in New Zealand. A regular good pair of Leckies or Black Diamond is going to run you 120 to 150 bucks a pair. Yes. And you could lose them on the airplanes. You can lose them on trail. They can get broken. These cost $30 at REI. They're Cuban, uh, not Cuban, carbon fiber. They are extremely light and they're real poles. I hey. know all kinds of, uh, you know, much, much more serious backpackers than me. This is what they recommend when they go overseas. Like in this country, I use my other trekking poles because I just like them. But going overseas, it doesn't matter if you lose a $30 item. It does matter if I lose a $150 item. So anyway, REI, uh, not REI, Costco has them right now. Uh, it's, you can't read, they're Cascade Mountain Tech. Uh, it's a seasonal item. They won't have them much longer. But trekking poles are, abs and there's a technique to using them as well. well. But uh, they are absolutely. I, I, I will. I will mention the technique technique here just briefly. Um, uh, there is a, a woman in the Bay Area who's the guru of trekking poles, named uh, Jaya Pauly. Uh, and if you uh, go to her uh, uh, website, uh, that you can find her trekking pole courses. And I strongly recommend you do that because there is technique, and I see lots of pilgrims out there not using the correct te technique right. and uh, wasting energy and uh, potentially falling. Uh, and um, and it's, I, I cringe when I see uh, uh, people on the, on the Camino with these poles. So um, I'll, I'll put her name in the, in the chat here. Uh, if you Google it, you'll find her, uh, her website uh, and her uh, pole, trekking pole course. She offers them in the East Bay through the East Bay Regional Parks. It costs about fifty dollars for a, a course, uh, and uh, it's well—it's money well spent, 
and she will bring to her first course about 50 sets of polls. So you can try them out and see what you like because there are differences. Anyway, trekking poles, I, I have Z poles and Z poles are uh, fold up into a little tidy packet like this. And what I like about them is I can get them on the airplane. Um, yeah, there we go. looks like there, she's got some Z poles there. Uh, Susan has some G Z poles. What I like about them, see one of the problems that you have with trekking poles is that in theory, you aren't supposed to take them on the, as carry-ons, uh, that the TSA will get pissed at you if you, if you try to carry them in. Um, but the Z poles are sufficiently small that you can stuff them in your backpack and they, they don't really know that they're trekking poles. They, they might think they're, they're something else. So, um, uh, uh, but they're more expensive. They're about $160 a pair. They, they, are, they are not cheap. Um, and, and also, one more thing, one more gripe here. You need to have rubber tips on them because when you're going through towns, you don't like that click, 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 click. Then when you're out of the countryside, you take the rubber tips off and you should take an extra set of rubber tips. Oh, there we go, Susan. Susan's got her rubber tips there. Good girl, yeah. Um, and I take an extra set of rubber tips is because they come off and you lose them. So um, rubber tips are important. Uh, what do we got in the next one? Then we'll get someone else. But Martin, where's my where's my list? Trekking poles, yeah. Rubber tip protection, hydration. Okay. Um, well, you got. Uh, what, what do you do? Does anybody have a water bladder that they take? Yes. Okay, Susan. Let's hear about that. <laughs> oh, where to put it? Yes, well, kind of, kind of uh, you know, look at what the day, what the weather report mm -hmm. is and decide, I don't know if you fill it all the way to the top, but, you know, sort out the day with the well I think I'll need. And, um, you know, it slides right into the, into the backpack, right in between the, well, into the back of the backpack. And um, it's just really convenient. Sometimes I buy an extra, like I have a, uh, a soda or something and I'll have the empty bottle and I may fill that and keep that in the side pocket if I want to want to chug a log rather than work to get it out of the bladder but yeah the bladder works fine for us and I don't have any problems some people seem to have a, a problem with keeping them clean I don't do much except bring it home rinse it out and be sure it gets thoroughly dry and then store it away if you get if you're concerned there's something in there I guess I'd add a little chlorine for a day or two then rinse it real well and let it dry. But, uh, I, you know, it's worked fine for us for years and years. That's good, Susan, thank you. Um, all right, what's what's next on the list, Martin? I think we're just about done here. Uh, you didn't do rain gear. Do you want to do rain gear or? Uh, I thought I did. Oh, maybe I didn't do rain gear. No. Um, okay, yes, you're right. We skipped over rain gear, very important. I did that on purpose because I know that it, how controversial rain gear is. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so um, uh, rain gear. Um, uh, Susan, since you brought it up, what do you take? Well, you know, the umbrellas I just showed you, I bring those, yeah. one of those. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I'm on the side that likes a nice rain jacket. And mm -hmm. um, I mean, it isn't just a rain jacket. It, it's, you need an extra layer in the morning, you've got it. Yep. You put something on when you're doing your laundry and you wanna wash everything, you can actually put on your rain gear. <laughs> so I also have rain pants. Um, these I got years ago, they're, uh, what's her name? It's HH, it's, what does that stand for, Scott? Uh, Kelly Hansen. Okay, I bought these years ago. They're really hit too heavy, but I somehow lost the ones I really like, which have uh, zippers along the side. So if you want to put the rain pants on during the middle of the day without taking your shoes off, uh, the full zips are nice, but they do add to the weight. But uh, often in the morning, I want something extra and I will put on the rain gear and then I can take it off whenever it gets warm enough. So that's... That's my rain. Yeah, the, 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 the debate on rain gear is whether you wear rain gear or whether you do a poncho. And some uh, people, half, half the pilgrims will say ponchos are best, and the other half the pilgrims will say rain gear is best. Uh, I personally like rain gear because it, it not only keeps the rain off, it keeps me warm. 
uh, if it's if it's not raining out and it's windy, I can put on that rain jacket and I'll stay warmer. Okay, uh, but it is a ponchos, but they don't know. keep the bottom. Your you know your pants still get all wet, and I can't stand having my pants flapping around wet. So I like having well, what, what what I don't like about rain gear is perspiration on the inside. I have a tendency to perspire inside of it, and they get they get damp. So um, I, I wear shorts inside the rain gear. Okay. Uh, if it's going to be, the, I'm sorry. Yeah, and you then on? you need the zippers on the side, right? <laughs> on the on your jacket, it's really nice to have the pit zips. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, that helps a lot. And the rain definitely. pants, if they're if they're the zipper type on the side, you can uh, lower the zipper a little bit. You can bring it up a little bit, so you can right. have ventilation even though you have your rain pants on. You don't have to take them off. What do you have, lawyer? Lawyer, uh, Lori, well, what is yours? Um, Susan was just mentioning pit zips. So it's yeah, um, a zipper opening under your armpit to yeah. um, let your armpit breathe. So this right. is a lightweight marmot rain jacket mm -hmm. that I like to wear and it has a hood inside this collar. So I've been using this on my Caminos and I like it. But um, I have brought one of those cheap little plastic ponchos before and during a downpour, I used that in addition to this um, because the poncho actually fit over my backpack. So I think somebody mentioned in the chat, they, they bought a cheap little dollar store poncho and there's, um, that's a perfectly good solution and they're lightweight. Mm -hmm. um, and you see a lot of pilgrims using those on the Camino as right. well. And Rob, right. to address your issue with the perspiration, um, yes, I, any breathable fabric, I've said this a little bit before, will not perspire once it is saturated. Once the outside of it is wet, there's no pores. And that's why when you're really in a rainstorm, in a breathable fabric, you'll be soaked inside. It's the reason for an umbrella, as long mm -hmm. as you can keep it up. Because the umbrella will keep a lot of the rain off of your upper body, which is where most of the perspiration is happening. So I always keep my zip down because I'm with all you guys. I use rain pants and a rain jacket. And actually, I use a rain kilt as well. Uh, and the kilt is for when I'm in shorts. And it just keeps my shorts dry. I don't have to put on the pants and the whole bit. But the main thing is try to keep your rain gear dry. That's kind of counterintuitive. But as long as your rain gear is dry, it's going to be breathing. So that's the reason for using an umbrella. Well, I, 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 I have learned from Scott. And I use an umbrella, so and I, uh, I, I have two of the those nice uh, silver dome umbrellas, and I love them. So, uh, uh, let's see, uh, Martin. Can we go back to the slides here? See where we are. I think we're almost done. Oh, snacks. Well, I'll just simply say that you need to have food. Um, everybody carries food. There's lots of sources in Spain. Um, there, I think uh, Scott or one of you guys takes little plastic uh, Tupperware type of things where you put your food for the day. I remember that from a previous a previous uh, uh, presentation. I think that's great, you know. Um, I use plastic bags, Ziploc, Ziploc bags. Toiletries, um, oh yeah, let's go back to toiletries. Oh, if, if you're really obsessive, you cut your toothbrush in half to save a fraction of an ounce. Uh, I have a great shaving system uh, that's that's, about uh, two ounces and I can shave uh, just fine with it. Uh, of course, Scott doesn't care. Um, uh, I use, um, I use um, bar shampoo, okay? Uh, and uh, various other toiletries. Yes, I carry toilet paper. Um, you're gonna be out in the woods someplace where you're gonna need it. And uh, you better get used to, to, to going in the bushes because it's gonna happen. Okay, uh, when you're walking, so that's a that's a possibility. Okay, next slide. I think we're done. Oh, first aid kit. Yes, everybody should carry a first aid kit. Um, you need uh, uh, stuff for blisters in there. I take second skin. Uh, the stuff that you get in the uh, pharmacies in Spain is called Compede. I'm not a fan of it. It's very sticky and gets. I've ruined some socks because of Compede. Uh, but uh, you can get it there, uh, and uh, you will get scrapes. You will get cuts. Take Band-Aids. You're going to need it. Okay. I've had a number of problems like this, so I have a little first aid kit. I don't have it here that I take with me. Uh, now, what, what I do with my wife and me is 
I carry the first aid kit and she doesn't carry anything. So if you're with a group of people, you can have one first aid kit, but you're gonna need something. And of course, sunburn is, is an issue. Okay, next slide, please. Oh, little things. I love little things. Uh, everybody has their, their um, where's, my, where's my little thing here? Is it down in here? I brought it. Oh, yes. So this is called a ditty bag. And a ditty bag is what you keep your ditty in. And your ditty is all the little stuff. So I've got all sorts. I'm not going to go through it all, but uh, this has my, my stuff in it. So I've got duct tape. I have a spork. I have uh, safety pins, clothes pins. I've got all that stuff in here, including uh, my favorite. Uh, you know, you, I saw, we saw what uh, uh, Scott showed us with his backpack, which I have in here in my ditty bag. Here's the backpack. But I have one, I have a one up on you, Scott, on that one here. And that's this guy right here. Okay. This is a clothesline. And with this, you don't need clothespins because it has these little slidey things on it. I got it's all messed up right now, but you can just put your socks in there and slide these things together and you, they'll, they'll hang up there. So this, this is, this is my, my, my favorite little thing that I carry. And I know Susan had something that was really fun that you took, a little thing. Do you remember what it was, Susan? No, it doesn't matter if you can't remember. I remember we, in a previous carry, presentation. We carry, you have the right length. We carry a little bit of the, you know, cord to hang on. Um, right. And either pins, safety pins, or clothes pins. Right. Um, right. But I kind of consider it a challenge to, <laughs> I consider it a challenge to find a way to get my clothes dry. Because I wash everything, you know, except what I have on almost every night. And so... Yeah. Uh, I, I consider it a personal challenge to find a way to get them dry. So the hiking poles can be propped against all kinds of things. So if you have a desk over here or a chair over here, or, you know, depending on wherever, you can put a hiking pole there. You can drape stuff over that. Um, mm. Anyway, you can be very creative. I can't remember anything special beyond that, Scott, but I know that some people take the, the clothespins some people take the uh, diaper pins, that kind of thing. Yeah, I've, I've never tried the the, uh, uh, the hiking poles a bit. Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's interesting. <laughs> hiking poles. Okay. And Rob, I think we should mention what is a given away at every Camino event we have. A little bag of these guys, tiny, tiny clothespins. <laughs> right. <laughs> and they weigh yeah. almost nothing. But Katie and I, yeah, I, I have I have several of those bags also. Yeah. Tiny clothes pins. And they're, they're, they are handy, I admit. Yeah. Okay, next slide, Martin. I think we're just done. Oh, clothes. Oh, God. Okay. Well, um, uh, you need something to wear during the day. Uh, it's nice to have something different to wear at night. Uh, you you, you got to decide what you're going to sleep in. If it's cold, you need cold weather clothes. Some of us take luxury items. I I take a special t-shirt that I sleep in at night. That's my luxury item. Um, and then you got to wash clothes. Does anybody have anything to say about clothes? Yes, I do. Okay, uh, Susan. Well, what I have on is pretty much what I would be wearing on the trail. Mm -hmm. And like I said, I like to be prepared to go into someplace fancier. So I sometimes carry a, a hiking skirt mm -hmm. or a, a pair of dark pants. Mm -hmm. And then I have my favorite item, which is my smart wool top that I have had forever that, mm -hmm. um, that I wear as a sweater, or you can sleep in it, and it never stinks, <laughs> one of its best mm -hmm. features. And then I carry some kind of scarf, which, of course, weighs nothing. And then I am ready to go into, <laughs> you know, a little more fancy place to eat than uh, you would normally find on a you know, a hostel. So that's well, Susan is clearly Susan is clearly our fashionista here for this, you know. So <laughs> that's good. Yeah. Yeah. Smart wool is a wonderful fabric. Yes. Because it, it doesn't smell after a while. I do the same. Anybody, anybody else have anything special to wear? <laughs> anything else? 
Um, yeah, Rob, I know we have to wrap this up pretty soon, but um, I like to hike and address sometimes, but I can also get fancy like Susan. <laughs> um, and I got this dress, it's a um, purple rain skirt design. She uh, was hiking the Appalachian Trail and she wanted to hike in a dress and or a skirt. And so she made her own, but anyway, it's stretchy, it has pockets and it's lightweight material that should dry fast. So I'm gonna do that. And then um, I just wanna also say that uh, a nice little scarf is lightweight and it could add um, a little bit of protection from the wind. And then you can get a nice scarf in the cathedral in Santiago. Um, I got this one on my first Camino and I got this one on my third Camino. And when you buy from the cathedral store, you're supporting the cathedral and they have a lot of re restoring and uh, repairs to do. So just something for the ladies, if you wanna buy yourself a treat, <laughs> uh, scarves are a good thing to bring back. I, uh, I, I, I don't have a scarf, but I have a buff. So if you're familiar yeah, with a buff, right. uh, buffs are, 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 are wonderful things because they can be good in hot weather, they can be good in cold weather, they can keep the dust out of your face, they can uh, keep the sun off your head. I, I highly recommend a buff uh, and you can get them at uh, REI or any place like that. All right, one more, what's the next slide say? Um, sources, oh, well, you know REI. Uh, in Spain, there's De Catalan, uh, and it, it used to be in Emeryville, and then they closed it. I don't know what, uh, what why they closed it, but uh, you can find De Catalans all over Spain. Uh, I've bought stuff there, and it's uh, moderately priced trekking clothes. Um, and there are stores that I found in Europe that are just like REI. There's a store in Lyon. When you, I swear when I walked into it, I was walking into a mini REI. Looked just the same. So there's lots of sources. Uh, you can buy stuff online. There are gear review sites. I'm sure that Scott would be able to point you in some of those. Uh, next slide, please. Actually, we, we should say while we're on gear, go online and just type in ultralight backpacking gear. And there mm -hmm. we have spawned a cottage industry of ultralight gear that is the envy of the world. People in all the rest of the world buy our gear because it's so ultralight and so so good uh, from the sleeping quilts and packs to tent. So there are many, many companies out there beyond REI that put out gear much lighter than you can get at REI. And those like the now, REI that, is not REI is not known for ultralight. No, that's what uh, I'm saying. But whereas the pack that that uh, Lori has been showing us, that's a half pound pack. I mean, that's amazing. And it's a beautiful pack from Gossamer Gear. And uh, mm -hmm. Gossamer Gear is a fantastic company. z -Packs, there's, there's a bunch of really neat ultralight companies across this country. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, so, I want, what's I want that, Lori? Um, go ahead, Lori. <laughs> this is a packing cube to help um, minimize the chaos that happens in backpacks. So um, it's a lightweight Eagle Creek brand. And this one expands, um, but you can stuff a lot of things in here and um, it keeps everything tidy. That's one approach. <laughs> so I, want... I um, uh, uh, just gonna, uh, can you spotlight me? Where am I? You, standard, okay. Yeah, so I, this is an Eagle Creek bag. I, I have a whole bunch of these little ones. I put my toiletries in one, this is my electronics bag. This has the chargers and the cables and all that sort of stuff in it. So it weighs, you know, the, the packaging weighs practically nothing, but I can just throw it in my pack and it's not scattered all over the place. So I have, I have one of these for first aid. I have one of these for toiletries uh, and this one's for electronics, uh, those types of things. Yeah, I like these packing cubes. Unfortunately, Eagle Creek is out of business or something like that. They, they, I think they're closing up shop, but anyway. So, so you can neatly, so there's different ways to pack, okay? Uh, and Scott will tell you how to pack an ultralight backpack. I don't know how to do it. Uh, so I'm not gonna try to tell you about that, but talk to Scott, he claims that you can pack it and you get uh, frame support. This is the sort of conventional wisdom. 
you, you put the heavy things up high and the light things below. And, or there's my approach, which is next, uh, next slide, please. Okay. The unorganized approach, stuff it in there. And I, I find that in my experience, um, you know, here in the States, oh, I do, I, I'm, I'm meticulous in terms of that backpack. Once I've been out there for about two or three days, that's the end of it. You know, at that point, everything just gets thrown in the backpack. And, you know, I don't worry about it anymore. Uh, you know, it's, it's not worth it in the morning for me to, uh, to go through the whole backpack packing. All right, uh, next slide. I think we're just about done. Oh, airport transport. Well, you, can, you, you can't carry your sharps through security. So you got to figure out some way of doing that. Uh, and poles may or may not go through security. So what I do for poles, uh, and well, I have several different techniques that I use, but what I have for poles is I have uh, this here, it weighs about three ounces. What it is, is a tent pole bag. Uh, and I um, put my poles in this, I put my sharps in it. I have a airport tag right here at the bottom. I tighten it up and I check it through just like this. And I've never had any trouble with it. So that's a, that's, it weighs about three ounces. So uh, that's what I do for poles. Uh, so people do all sorts of different things with poles. Um, and I, I take, I try to take my backpack as, as carry on. I really don't want the luggage monkeys, I'll call them that, throwing my expensive backpack around down there, you know, or the whole thing getting caught up uh, in the conveyor belt and, and ripped apart. So I try, I take my backpack on, and if, if they won't let me take my poles, I stick it in a bag like that and send it through separately. Any other comments about airplane trans, airport, airplane transport? We have, I do the same, Rob. I, I never let my backpack out of my sight. That goes with me onto the plane with the most important stuff. But all the sharps and anything extra that, that is too much to you know, make the size limit, I, we have put in a box and just taped it up and had that go in. We've also taken old pieces of luggage that we happen to have in the basement, mm -hmm. use them, and then just throw them away when you get there right. or leave it, leave it for somebody at the airport on the other end. But what I, what I often do is, is I take a duffel bag uh, with all of that extra stuff in it, uh, and I leave it at the hotel, uh, and they'll store it for me so that when I come back, I got a change of clothes and they aren't so smelly. Uh, and I've got my PJs in there, which I've missed for a month, you know. And so I can put on my PJs and I can be comfortable there. So that, that means that you're coming back to the same hotel. Uh, but if you are, uh, these hotels will store stuff for you. Anything else? Uh, what do we got here, Martin? Any, do I have any more slides? I think we're just about done. Questions, okay. Oh my God, I hate to think how many questions there are over here. And I don't know uh, how many we'll be able to get to. So let me go back to the beginning here and take a look at the questions. Uh, uh, okay, the, a lot of this is about what people are going to do. Okay. I will be on the Portuguese starting around, um, around June, sixth or seventh, something like that, for 10 days. Um, I'm going through the, the, uh, the, the, the a lot of this in the um, uh, chat is where people are going, which is great. Well, here's somebody starting the spiritual variant in June 3rd. We might overcome, uh, we, might, we might pass each other. We're leaving from Aguarda, which is at the bottom tip of, of, um, of Spain. Okay, Santa Brace. Yeah, let's see. <laughs> By the way, you can save the chat. Uh, you just have to do it before we get out of here. 
Rob, okay. this is Guy. Uh, since we've been kind of people been pitching in and some of us have been answering questions along the way, there are a couple that have been standing out that I thought maybe I could throw it out to the group here or to you. And That would be great because okay. I, I, this is the first time. Yeah, it's a, what, it's what, a lot what, to what go through. Thought? Yep. Um, I saw a couple of questions about sleeping system going back to that and the whole uh, decision around liner or sleeper, uh, mm -hmm. sleeping bag. So mm -hmm. um, comments guidance on that topic, which I know can be. Yeah, I use a Sea to Summit sleep sack that's treated um, with an anti-insect thing. Um, I bought it from REI. It, it packs up into something this small. I don't have it with me. It's in with my camping gear in the garage, but um, it's very soft and comfortable. And I'm going to use that on my next Camino. I've used it for every Camino. And Does it have any warmth to it? Um, a light, a little bit of warmth, um, enough for summer Caminos or late spring Caminos, which is what I've done. Um, and if, um, if I've been cold, like the Primitivo, I was cold a few nights, but there were blankets at the albergues. Um, and if you're- I've heard that you can't get those blankets anymore because of COVID. Does anybody know anything about that? I've heard the same thing. I, don't I do have a couple of, of pointers if I can jump in because I've had this question come into the chapter just this week and had to do a little bit of research to find out what's the latest and greatest. Um, I did a, a, some checking on the Camino form and specifically on blankets and there are several pilgrims that have reported just recently they've been walking the last within the last month that they were able to find blankets. Um, having checked in with our contact over that Rob was talking about earlier in Pomferrada on the Frances, who volunteers at three different albergues around there, um, specifically the one in Pomferrada, and that's on the Frances, a pretty major stopping point, is not, has not resumed offering blankets that they had stopped since you know reopening from COVID, and. Mm -hmm. It is pretty cold right now, so <laughs> it was answering a question for someone who's leaving uh, next week and debating about what to bring in the sleeping bag versus the lining. And because it is pretty cold there um, on the Frances, um, so, like so the bottom line is the bottom line is you can't count on bat, bat yeah, blanket. Not universally maybe, available. Maybe, maybe, but maybe not. Yeah. Yeah. We were on the Vesalé yeah. last September. Uh, that's in France, and uh, we stay in a range of accommodations, not just the albergues. Uh, there were times that we had to have our own sleeping bags, and other times it was like, you know, a hotel where everything was furnished. So uh, we have always carried our backpacks. This is a Z pack, and it weighs less than a pound. And uh, I think it goes down to, I don't know, 30 or 40 degrees. So uh, I do, I like having my own gear and knowing it's clean and not having to worry about any of it. Uh, and, and like Scott said, I spray the outside of the sleeping bag and the outside of my backpack with the permethrin uh, before we go so that we've never had a, yeah, Sawyer's brand. So we've never had a problem with bed bugs. So I advise that too. So I just wanna add real quick, another part of my sleep system is I like, when it's cold, I wear this um, Uniqlo Heat Tech long sleeve top. And I also have leggings too. It's it's super lightweight, breathable, stretchy, um, and yeah, that that's an extra layer of warmth whether I need to wear it sleeping or hiking. Hmm. Well, I'm I'm going to show mine because I'm probably the only person that does it. But I wear a full slip. That's my nightwear. And uh, if it's cold enough, then I put on my smart wool top, or I need want, want more you know coverage. Uh, my smart wool top and uh, and or my smart wool bottoms. So that's my sleep system. Great. Any other comments about sleepwear? Okay, Guy, did you have some other stuff that you noticed in the questions? Yeah, and it was, um, I think, uh, yeah, anything else from specifically Lori and Susan, because there was a question about, you know, from the uh, female panelists about sleeping uh, sleeping equipment or sleeping arrangement. Um, anything else you'd like to add specifically for your cases? Earplugs. Hello. You're going to have that, a lot of the board. snoring, right? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Where's my earplugs? Essential if you're staying in albergues. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
I don't know what you're talking about, Lori. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think I answered the questions about warmth and my sleep sack for that for that one. But any other questions? I see several comments questions in the in the chat about towels. Uh, there are backpacker towels that you can get at REI that are lightweight, highly absorbent, uh, and uh, so you probably should consider that. And a backpacker washcloth. Uh, ah, here we go. I, right on cue. Yeah. So REI sells these little washcloths with clips and mm -hmm. um, pouches, super yeah. lightweight, and they dry fast. And you yeah. want to clip this on your belt or your strap because a lot of times when you're in a bathroom, they don't have paper towels to dry your hands. Um, so it's nice to have your own washcloth to dry right. your hands. Right. Well, my washcloth is called a bandana and mm -hmm. it, it's multi-purpose. You can keep your hair under control or around your neck. Uh, it can be used to dry things. It can be used as a um, picnic table. You know, if you want to set it out and uh, put your food on it. That's so pretty. Pardon? <laughs> That's so pretty. Chili peppers. <laughs> yeah. No, this is from the Cajun country. So <laughs> anyway, I think uh, I think uh, bandanas are totally under under what am I trying to say? Underrated. <laughs> Underrated. Anyway, yes. I, 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 I'm uh, not even beginning to name all the possibilities here. Oh. Susan, Susan, I agree with you 100. percent The bandana is the probably one of the most important things and when it's hot you get it wet you put it around your neck uh you know you can use it it's it's an incredibly versatile item and oh, now you got your first, it's the first aid item you know if you yes, need absolutely I, I do want to show one other thing though you were talking about toileting uh mm -hmm. this is a little shovel so if you need to just to uh, some backpackers trowel so if you needed to dig a cat hole this is uh, a, a device that will do that interesting but don't leave no trace ethics are very important so don't be leaving toilet paper right around like we too often see if you have to go out in the woods take a plastic bag with you put your toilet paper in there uh, and take it then to a trash can someplace <laughs> thank you Lori. what were you holding oh yeah. my goodness okay uh, this is called the kula cloth it's um, a leave no trace principle item. And I got it at one of these long distance hiker things. So one side is super absorbent. The other side is waterproof. Um, so you can wipe down there. And then it comes with this stretchy hook uh, device. So you can let this dangle and dry and just wash it when you need to. So that's a leave no trace thing. It's called Kula Cloth and made by Wander Woman Gear. Huh. Leave no trace, ladies <laughs> and gents. Well, the, the women have all sorts of cool stuff. Why haven't they done this for men? <laughs> well, Rob, uh, need it. I, the cool thing for me is the only time I carry cotton is I always carry a cotton washcloth. I don't huh. like the feel of the uh, of the synthetic towels that you get from REI. I've used them for years, and they just don't they they don't wash really well. So this washes really well. I wring it out really tightly and I use it to dry myself off then and keep wringing it out. It takes longer to dry, but it's actually my little, uh, you know, item that I just love and bring. But you can hang it on, <laughs> on your backpack. backpack trips. <laughs> you can hang it on your backpack. And that's what I do. It dries the next day as I'm walking. Right. Any, any other, did you see anything else in there, Guy, that we've, we've missed? You're muted, Guy. <laughs> or you're not coming through. Well, I'm looking through, through now. Yes. There, now you're back. OK, I'm sorry about that. I, I think for the most part, people have pitched in and we've covered most of the topics there, but there certainly could be a few that we've totally missed. So um, maybe we might be able to take a show of hand, someone raising their hand if we've they have an urgent question to ask that we have missed or not touched upon. Yeah directly in some way. Linda Brown. Thank you. What's the oldest person you know that's done it? And how many miles a day might one expect if you're on the older side? I've known people that are over 80 that have done it. Wow. I'm 81. Ralph is 85. 
You guys rock. Wow. <laughs> I'm 76. My wife is 78. She doesn't walk anymore, but she uh, she goes. We're, I got we're going back. The... Oh. We're going back in June. Gina, um, I just had a quick question about the um, bug treatment stuff. I've never used it before, and I I'm not a fan of chemicals and stuff. Is there something that is recommended in that arena? Um, I heard lavender mm -hmm. oil can help um, repel insects mm -hmm. as well. So you can- Does, does little... lemongrass, I feel like I heard lemongrass does, does that? Um, I think so. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll do a little more research. Yeah. I just wasn't, I tried to, I don't know. I was wondering if anyone had used anything else that they would recommend. I, I, I went to the um, CDC at one point to look up the different types. And mm -hmm. most of the ones, you know, lavender oil and so on that you hear about, they just didn't find very effective. Okay. Uh, but I do agree with the, what Scott said that you, you want the spray to be, you want to spray whatever ahead of time outside, let mm -hmm. it dry, and you want to have it on the outside of things. You don't want to have it, you know, against your body. So that's why we're saying your, your mm -hmm. backpack, the outside of your sleeping bag, uh, but not on clothes and so on that you're going to have uh, next to your skin. Okay. It, All right. Thank, thank you. I, I've been concerned about this. Is it really safe against your skin? No, I'm, I'm not. I don't know if it is or not, but they recommend not to, and I don't have it yeah. against my skin. Scott, I I sleep on a sheet, and often my legs are bare, and I have never had an a, you know a reaction at all, and I've been doing it for thousands of miles, oh. so I don't have an issue with it all. It, they do tell you don't have it against your skin, but I've never had any issue. So, hmm. I, and I try not to. I mean, I try to wear something underneath yeah. that that keeps it off. But it's not. Scott, what is the name of the stuff that you use? It's uh, permethrin. You can get it okay. at REI, and okay. they've got oh, okay. a whole big racks of it. Okay. Um, but it's a chemical based on a chemical in chrysanthemums, which we can eat with impunity. Those are delicious in salads. So. <laughs> It's, but it's chrysanthemums are anti, you know, insect. That's one of the plants you, you uh, companion plant with a vegetable garden, keep bugs away. Right, it's almost six o'clock here. I think we have to wrap this up. So um, thank you, Rob and panelists and, and everybody who chimed in with questions and answers. Um, you can see- And I also want to thank Martin Pena, Pena for, his uh, great uh, leadership yes. that he's shown. Thank you, Martin. Um, this will be um, saved and shared on our YouTube channel. And Martin has been adding the um, all of our videos to our YouTube channel. The next one that we will have um, is the technology for the Camino presentation. So um, that will be on there um, in a few days or something within the next week, right, Martin? And then um, after that, this one will be posted. So um, thank you all and do some research, save the chat if you'd like to. I'm gonna save a copy of it and I'll share that on our NorCal Facebook group. And um, if you have any questions, you can email NorCal at AmericanPilgrims.org. Guy and I will um, answer the um, questions to the best of our ability or forward them to the experts in our chapter. And um, Guy, do you want to say anything else? I think we're good. Other than thank you, everyone, for the panelists here, for those just the wealth and knowledge that you shared, wealth of knowledge, wealth of knowledge <laughs> that you shared, as well as for everyone for attending this evening. Great questions, um, a lot of good sharing of information. I just want to say that I'm flying out on June 3rd. I expect to be in Santiago on, I think, June the 4th is June 5th. Um, and uh, I'll be there for four days before we start tricking the Portuguese. Uh, anybody that's around then or going to be any place near that, uh, please contact me. I'd love to meet you in Santiago, or I'd love to meet you on the Portuguese, uh, wherever you are. So, and, and Laura, Scott, I've got to say goodbye. I've got another Zoom starting right now. <laughs> Great. Okay. okay. Thank Thank you. Everybody. Thanks for coming Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for your great questions. Uh, thank you for organizing and thank you, Martin, for making it happen. <laughs> yeah.